talking about keeping things elegant, let's do this the way a calculus student would do this 2,300 years later. This was pure geometry. And that's the beauty of it. And the shortcoming is obvious. Uh, you had to be Archimedes to come up with something like this. And there's only one person who could do it, and it's Archimedes. So mere mortals can be inspired by this and try to imitate the flair, but we would have to move on to the problem that's not solved yet. OK, so let's swing to the opposite extreme of methodologies and do this problem the way a calculus student would do this problem. And the idea of calculus, as we teach it in high school, is, let's just say, very bad. The philosophy is, take your geometric problem, replace it with numbers and formulas as quickly as possible, and then completely forget where the problem came from, and just deal with the functions and the numbers. Okay, And that works for problems you see in calculus, and that also works almost for this problem, except I think all of you found that the homework was very cumbersome and not so simple. And so it creates a different challenge. The challenge here is that, you, is that it required a great deal of experience and ingenuity. The challenge with calculus is that it requires maybe no ingenuity to formulate the problem and to keep go and to get going, but to maintain the simplicity of the expressions and keep the problem algebraically tractable, that's the challenge. And so we have to devise techniques for doing that. And that, and that is its own world. And the techniques that we'll learn in this class, they'll be inspired by the geometry and the philosophy will be, well, let's preserve the geometric meaning and then maybe our expressions will remain elegant. Okay, so we won't see that here, but we will see that there is a great need, a great need to uh, keep the expressions contained. So we have a parabola. This might actually, I don't know how much space it'll take. And so now, of course, we'll have coordinate axes because we're doing it in Cartesian coordinates. And I've been raging against Cartesian coordinates. But, you know, this, is, this will actually, you know, sort of make, help me make that point. And the equation of this curve is ax squared plus bx plus c. And I will tell you right away, one simplification that occurs very quickly is that c doesn't matter. You guys agree with me? Because C just moves everything up and down. Ultimately, we'll learn that B doesn't matter either. But that, you know, it's a little too early to reject B. And so we pick two points, x0 and x1. Draw the tangents. Draw the chord. OK, and there are two areas that we have to calculate. First one, right up a calculus student's alley, and actually AP calculus, is to calculate this area. And the alternative, and the other calculation that we need to do is to calculate the area of this Archimedes triangle. So one is closer to integration, the other one is closer to differentiation. Okay, so if we create, so the first simplification that will occur, and you'll see it in just a moment, is that let's denote this, well, this is kind of like a line. So it's L of x, the equation for this chord. And the equation for this chord is, of course, well, it's not so simple, you know. So let's just ignore C because C definitely doesn't matter because it just lifts everything up and down. So let's just prove it for AX squared plus BX. And then for the more general parabola plus C, we can just say that it doesn't matter. So the equation is like this. It's AX0 squared plus bx0, because that's this value right here, plus on top here we have ax1 squared plus bx1 minus ax0 squared minus bx0 divided by x1 minus x0 times x minus x0, right? This is where you begin to feel a little bit intimidated by the complexity, right? Immediately, uh, the complexity of the problem begins to overwhelm you. You see where this comes from, right? This is essentially y0 plus y1 minus y0 divided by 
x1 minus x0 times x minus x0, right? That's what I wrote. And you know that this equation is right because when x equals x0, well, number one, this function is linear, and number two and three, when x equals x0, then this, is, this term is zero, and we just have y0, just like just what we need. And when x equals x1, then the denominator cancels, and then we have y0 plus this difference, so we get y1. So it's just the right thing. Another way to think of it is that this is slope, as calculus students like to say, this is rise over run, and so on. In any case, that's the equation. So how quickly things become intractable? And why do things become intractable? Well, that's because we took this blunt attitude towards, let's just take the given problem, uh, express everything as functions, and just work with it. And actually, if you have a program like Mathematica, maybe that's what, that is what you should do, right? Uh, the hard churning will be done for you. But for us, it requires a little bit of ingenuity. So what we ne essentially need to integrate from x0 to x1 is the difference lx minus f of x, okay, and dx. And I can actually know, show you exactly what this function is, right? Right. Here's my thinking about what this function is. Uh, well, first of all, this is a parabola. Let's just see, name all of the things that we can name about this difference, and then we'll see we have enough. So you agree that it's a parabola, because it's the difference between a quadratic function and a linear function. That's good. Is it a, a right-side-up parabola or an upside-down parabola? Upside-down. Well, if our original parabola is right-side-up, then this one is upside-down because we're subtracting the parabola. So it's upside down. What is its value at x0? Zero? zero, right? Because the two functions, L of x and F of x, agree at x equals zero. So when we're subtracting one from the other, it goes through zero. And what is its value at x1? Also zero. So it's a parabola, x1. So it's a parabola that looks like this. And we know what the equation for a parabola that looks like this. Well, it's essentially x minus x0 times x minus x1. You guys agree? Because that's what you need to have to go through these zeros. Okay. Then there is also a minus sign because it's an upside down parabola. So we want x to be with a minus sign, x squared rather, to be with a minus sign, right? And then finally, what will be the coefficient? What will be the quadratic coefficient? Well, it's got to be a, right? Because that's the only source of quadraticism in this whole expression. So it's this. OK? So this is, this is what we need to integrate, a simple quadratic function. And this is when we realize that b doesn't matter either. Isn't that interesting? c doesn't matter, obviously. b doesn't matter. And so you see? So this is why we do algebra. This is why algebra is fun, because algebra in its own right requires ingenuity and, we, and insight. And we just used a little bit of insight to do away with the most cumbersome part of the whole calculation. Yes. But that's a slight technical detail. And the answer ends up being 1, 6, A, X1 minus X0 cubed. Yes? That's the answer that you get. So it's very simple. Depends only on a, x0, and x1. OK, that's good. That's maybe what we expect it to be relatively simple, the area under the parabola. Now let's tackle the triangle. Ah, oh, by the way, I knew I'd have to mention it at some point, but let's remember the formula for a triangle with coordinates x1. So if in a Cartesian plane, if you have these three points, what is the, one of the more elegant expressions for the area of the triangle? So in an earlier lecture, I mentioned that there's hundreds of formulas for the area of the triangle. And, first of, and I also wanted to mention that this will be an object of our study. 
to derive this to, to derive this formula. But the formula is very elegant. It's you have to take a three by three determinant that has ones and then x1, y1, x2, y2, and x3, y3. That's the formula we'll go for with a one half. That's the area of the triangle because we already have three points. And I will order them like this, one, two, three, so that our triangle is counterclockwise oriented. For this to be positive, we'll study all of this. The triangle needs to be positively oriented. So we already have most of the numbers here, one, one. We just have to find the third point, okay, which is right here. Well, we need the equations for the tangent. The first one, how about t1 of x? By the way, before I go any further, from our previous discussion, do you know what the answer will be for what, for what the x for this point is? Yeah, it's, it's going to be exactly halfway between x0 and x1. Did you get that too in your calculations? Okay, so that's a relatively simple calculation. It's Right? That's the equation of this tangent line. What a wonderful basic calculus AP problem, right? Because this is the point, this is the slope, that's calculus, and this is uh, a good way to do it because you know that when you plug in x1, you just get y1. So everything here is constants except for x. So when you equate the two, it's just a linear equation. There's no challenge. Yes, the coefficients might be big, but it's just a linear equation. So I won't waste your tuition money on solving this equation. It's just that the solution becomes x1 plus x2 over 2. It just has this simple solution. Again, uh, I could probably get cute and start manipulating this algebraically, which is actually a very productive activity. If you're doing algebra, you should be having fun with algebra and finding ways of containing your expressions. But here's what we get. x1 plus x2 divided by 2, right? And then any one of these evaluated at the appropriate point. So let's evaluate this one, right? So I just need to plug in this value into one of these, and I would get the same value. So let's see what I get. So I'll erase T2, and what we need is T1 at x1 plus x2 over 2. At x1 plus x2 over 2 equals, okay, ax0 squared plus b x0, sorry, forgot the plus, plus 2ax0 plus b, and here it comes. This minus, minus x, oh, I'm sorry, x0 plus x1. Ah, oh, you guys should have corrected me. x0 plus x1, sorry about that. Uh, I, have a, I have a plan because I also love linear algebra. So it becomes Okay, and the area that I'm looking for of the triangle equals one half this determinant. Are you looking forward to evaluating this determinant? So I am, does someone say I'm good? Yeah. Okay, so let's have fun with the determinants. Never give up. Always keep it elegant. So the first thing I'm going to do is I will multiply this line by 2 just to get rid of fractions. Why not? Good question. Can you do that in the determinant? You can do that in the determinant, except, of course, it doubles the determinant. So to make up for that, I will replace 1 half with 1 quarter. Now I've preserved the overall value. I've doubled the determinant. But now I've made up for it by putting in an extra factor of one half. And now look what I'll do. So you know from studying linear algebra, right, 
some of you, that you can do, perform Gauss steps of Gaussian elimination. This was one of them. This is the step that affects the determinant by a factor of two, so I made up for it. But the thing you can do without any penalty is subtract a multiple of one row from another to how this number is the sum of these two, and this number is the sum of these two, right? So I will subtract third row from the second and first row from the second. Uh, isn't that fun? Now I think we can start canceling. AX0 and 2AX0 squared and 2AX0 squared, that goes away and this becomes a 1. 2BX0 and minus 0BX, that goes away and that becomes a 1. Okay? And now, do you see how there is BX0 and from here we get minus BX0. And here is minus BX1 and from here we get bx1. So everything have, that includes b goes away. Are you guys feeling better about things? Okay, now let's see what we have. We have ax0 squared minus 2ax0 squared. I'm kind of distributing in my RAM and then just writing down the answer. So that cancels and it, the whole becomes minus AX0 overall. You guys are with me on that? Okay, so that's good. So this is gone, and that's all that's left. 2 AX0 AX1. So we have this term, this term, and this term. Let me write it cleanly. And this is, of course, X0 minus X1 squared. Do you see how, by using ingenuity, right, we just never let things get out of control. You can't regain control once you lose control, right? So it's this times the determinant of this, but with a minus sign because this is in position 2, 3. Ah, how pretty. So just to explain again. So it's this number times this determinant which is x1 minus x0, and another minus sign is because this entry right here is in the position 2, 3, which comes with a minus sign in the Laplace expansion. There you go. So that's the area of the triangle. And so indeed, the area in the parabola, enclosed by the parabola, is two-thirds of the triangle. So let's compare the two methods. Requires absolute one-of-a-kind brilliance, but it's elegant. It never got ugly. It never threatened to get ugly. It just remained like a beautiful work of art throughout, but requires tremendous ingenuity. This one so required its own kind of ingenuity. But you see, it's much more contained. This was really technique, technique and a little bit of insight and it was all in the name of keeping the algebraic expressions tractable. So how, that's how the two methods compare, the two extremes. Our focus will be on something in between, something that allows us to leverage the full power of algebra, but at the same time does not say, forget about geometry. It will be an approach that preserves the geometry while enabling you to do algebra. And a wonderful side effect of that will be that Algebraic expressions will always stay contained, and they always remain uh, imbued with geometric meaning, and so we'll know what we're working with. We'll never, we'll never lose that. <laughs>